This is my letter. Dear future fans and scholars, here's a quote from Audrey. At night, sleep locks me in an echoless coffin. Sometimes I, at noon, I dream there is nothing to fear. That's from her poem, Prologue. When I chose that quote from Audrey's poem, little did I know who the woman was behind it. Since then, there is little that has gone undiscovered or underanalyzed about poets and activists of the magnitude of Audrey and Pat. But there are a couple of aspects I believe sometimes remain unacknowledged. We know of Audrey and Pat's scholarly and political accomplishments, but often we forget their youth and their capacity for fun at the time of these accomplishments. Like most of the folks filling our streets for the Black Lives Matters demonstrations, Pat and Audrey were also eager and young and sometimes playful. When they were beginning their important work, Audrey and Pat were the age many of you are, they're acolytes now. And they experienced anxiety, uncertainty, intimidation, much the same as you and I have. Audrey talked about an early experience during the Black Arts Movement when a magazine editor didn't understand a line in her poem that revealed the love interest was another woman. The editor decided to, quote, clarify her poem, that is to obscure the lesbian intent. That was done in only that one publication. With experience, Audrey never let her work be clarified again. I point to their youth, to their youth as they shaped their work because I believe we weaken our own possibilities to have an impact on our communities if we treat our icons as if they sprang fully formed as heroes like some ancient Greek myth. Audrey and Pat each had childhoods and adolescences in which they were concerned about their looks, their weight, their clothes, their friends, their futures as most young women do. The power in their iconic status is really in their humanity and the human frailties they, like us, managed throughout their lives. I feel fortunate to have gotten close enough to glimmer their humanity and use their perceptions to urge myself onward when things feel overwhelming like tonight as I sit waiting to hear the last voting results. That period we call the second wave of feminism has been unfairly characterized as grim, doctrinaire, and colorless. I think that leads you to not see activists of that period clearly. The truth is we could never have accomplished half the things we did without a sense of humor or a sense of our own sensuality. Two stories. In 1984, I interviewed Audrey and another activist, Mao Flowers, for the film Before Stonewall at a small cafe in the West Village. The interview went great. They were fun. They knew all of their history and how to talk about it without being uh, boring. Um, and then we were done and the crew was clearing up and we kept talking, the, the uh, cafe owner kept giving us free wine. So we sat there and we kept talking. And then I noticed that Audrey and Maua were trying to outweigh each other to see who was gonna have dinner with me. It was a time honored tradition between old bar dykes. Who can outlast who and spend the evening with the girl? It didn't matter that we were all in relationships that would not go any further than dinner. Those two could not help flirting and maneuvering. And over dinner with Audrey, I teased about her proficient flirting. A couple of years ago, when I described that uh, scene at a, well, I was at a huge celebration 
of Audrey uh, in Oakland and I described that scene. Afterwards, a bunch of young women came up to me and uh, expressed their surprise that Audrey Lord was flirtatious with anyone. I was shocked they couldn't imagine that. But then I realized that they all thought of Audrey as if she were a bronze statue. And I wouldn't mind a bronze statue of Audrey if we could replace some of the ones of the colonizers up around the Bay Area, but that's another letter. Again, in the 1980s, I similarly got a good sense of the woman that Pat Parker was at a National Black Queer Conference. She recruited several of, several of us to do a performance of her poem, Movement in Black. She got a uh, poet, Cheryl Clark, essayist and activist, Barbara Smith and me uh, to come into a hurried rehearsal to do Movement in Black and we would be the backup singers and Pat would be the lead singer. And we were really apprehensive. We were all from the East Coast. There's a big divide there. And we'd all, and Pat was from the West Coast and um, Pat was rumored to be exacting and tough. So Barbara Sherl and I uh, went into this rehearsal, uh, which was gonna be complete with steps like the Supremes. Um, and we were so nervous um, and it could have been a drag. It could have been a disaster. There was a whole lot of egos in that room um, and all of us afraid that we were gonna screw up and Pat was gonna be furious. But Pat, she started by calling into the room our favorite girl groups, the Shirelles, the Ronettes, Martha and Vandellas. And almost immediately, we all dropped into the rhythm of the music we'd grown up with and the revolutionary spirit of the work. Pat knew that reminding of us, us of our sisterhood was the way to touch us through all of the anxiety we were carrying. We spent, a, we spent a good bit of that rehearsal laughing at stories we told each other about our teen years when those girl groups provided our soundtrack. Pat, very precise with her own work, was proud she'd assembled such a stellar group of Black backups. It was in those brief moments with Audrey and Pat where we laughed with and at each other that I learned just how human and just how iconic they are. I recommend all of you always remember their humanity and their humor, and you really know Audrey and Pat and their work. When I see the young demonstrators, I always hear the lines of Pat's poem. Movement in black, movement in black, you can't keep us back. Thank you. <laughs>